I had a great discussion with my sons, I have three sons, yesterday, and uh, they mentioned the Hubble spacecraft and how, how much time and money it took to grind the lens for that uh, in the sky, <laughs> in space, actually, telescope, which can see a hundred billion galaxies. And they think in you know, when they grind the next one, it'll be 200 billion, which means if you if you divided every person on the earth into that number and everybody was given uh, charge over a galaxy, it would be eight galaxies per person on the face of the earth. So it makes everything look kind of small when you think about how great the universe is and how little we are. But uh, the scripture says we're going to go into the heavens, which is the galaxies, and establish them in the book of Isaiah, which is an amazing uh, concept of our destiny. So the Hubble Space Lens allows us to see far off, and uh, that's really important to have that kind of vision when it comes to spirituality. But there are things, as I was mentioning in the last broadcast, that hinder our ability to see far off, things that have been introduced into our thinking that are wrong. And uh, we know from parables that uh, uh, there's a story that Jesus taught about uh, having a guy had a, uh, a, a plantation and somebody sowed into that plantation poisonous plants and you couldn't tell the difference. Uh, they're called wheats and tares, the wheats and the tares uh, parable. So we know that there's things that the forces of darkness try to plant into us that hinder the crop, or, or in this case, uh, we've been relating it to vision, hinder our vision. And those things are called heresies. Heresies were rampant in that first century. There are six or seven major heresies. And the word for heresy in the Bible is the word eresis. Uh, it really means opinion opinion. So the heresies that have been uh, introduced throughout history are not just major heresies. They can be all kinds of things that uh, are sown into the field, so to speak, and they wreck the crop. And in this case, we're rela relating the crop to how we see and how we hear. Uh, Jesus taught, beware of what you hear. Take heed to what you hear. And uh, I wonder sometimes how deep we take the teachings or the words of Jesus to heart to where we really contemplate what he said. Uh, one of the things that he said uh, that I think we uh, kind of don't really think deeply about, and I'm, when I say deeply, seeing far off about, is uh, when he was approached by his disciples and they were marveling at uh, the buildings around the temple and the temple itself. And they said, look at these buildings, the Lord Jesus. They didn't call him Lord in those days. They said, master or teacher, uh, look at these wonderful buildings. And he said to them, hey, listen, <laughs> I hate to tell you this, but uh, not one stone is going to be left standing upon here. Forty years later, of course, the Romans came in, and that was a fulfillment of his word. And they tore down the whole city and everything around it, burned down, tore down the trees. There was nothing left except the Antonia Fortress, the, which was the fortress of the Romans, uh, that was the only thing left. The whole area was torn down exactly the way Jesus said it would be. There would be not one stone left standing. Well, they, they had a hard time hearing that. So they came back the next day and they said, well, we'll when will be the sign of your coming? And and uh, when will these things happen? And when, when will be the end of the age? And he said to them, don't be deceived. Don't be deceived. Many will come in my name. And he was speaking directly in light of people that would uh, deal with prophecy, prophecy teachers. Don't be deceived. They come in Jesus' name. Don't be deceived. I wonder how seriously we take Jesus' words when it comes to dealing with prophecy or what is commonly or sometimes called eschatology, eschatos, last things, ology, the study of last things. And so uh, there are heresies or opinions of men that relate to 
this particular field of study, biblical study, Holy Scripture study, uh, that deal with prophecy. Now, I want to talk to you about heresies within the realm of eschatology or prophecies that have a terrible effect on how we see. You know, prophecy, we, it's, it's kind of like saying, here's the future. We're going to show you the future. Prophecy. You'll see far off when you read what we have to say about prophecy. And don't forget the words of Jesus. Take heed what, to, what you hear. Take heed. Think seriously about this before you accept it into your heart or your spirit so it becomes part of you. When I was uh, just getting started in the faith, I kind of related to when I was uh, getting a job as an insurance salesman. I didn't know anything about insurance. I just had been a pastor for uh, three different churches, and now I felt like I should step away from it, and I did, but I didn't know what to do. So a friend came and said, you know, you'd really be good at selling health insurance. I said, I don't know a thing about it. Uh, I got a study to know that. It's going to take at least a year to figure that out. He said, oh, you don't need that. Uh, they'll give you a test down in San Diego, and uh, the people that give the test already give you the answer, so you can pass the test without ever having to study. I don't know. <laughs> what? Uh, but I did it, and the, country, the company that I hired me flew me back to Dallas to train me for three days, and when I came back out of that training period, uh, I was ready to sell health insurance, and I found when I went out there because of my training, little training that I had, I had a license now, uh, that people would accept what I had to say because I knew just a little bit more than they did about health insurance and about health. And I found that I was now in their eyes an expert when I certainly was not an expert, but I had enough knowledge to make them think that I knew more than them and therefore they should, because I had a license now and knew more than them. Well, you know, I was a, I was a credible person and they could buy from me. Now I was sold, sold a good product and I wasn't cheating anybody. The point I'm trying to make is that if somebody knows a few more scriptures than you do specifically, in the realm of prophecy, then you would tend to uh, follow them because they knew more uh, scripture than do they you did, and they would string together scriptures and create a picture uh, that you know was really solid and sound, at least from your point of view. And because they seemed to be more of a professional, or somebody was more credible, or somebody that knew more than you, that you should accept it. And this is what happens to people that. Uh, are ignorant. And I was at the beginning of my experience in the faith. Uh, I was ignorant. I just didn't know. And ignorance simply means without knowledge. I just simply didn't know anything. So anybody that said anything about eschatology, the study of last things, uh, was interesting to me because who doesn't want to know about the future? Everybody does. That's why almost every successful film or book that people buy is about the future. We love stuff about the future, back to the future. We love time travel, all these things. So it fascinates us. So we want to know about the future, especially today in light of the rioting in the streets and the, the, the virus out there. What's going to happen? What's going to happen politically? Will, will the president be reelected or not? Whatever. Everybody wants to know. Everybody wants to have a jump on things. And so uh, there's so many people that give prognostications on on uh, money and, and the stock market and all of these things because we have a very amazing interest in what's going to happen. So when it comes to prophecy, biblical prophecy, these are the titles that people buy and look into because they want to know the future. So in my situation back, I'm talking about in the in, in 19, late 60s, early 70s, I was this open sieve open vessel that was ready to consume anything and everything about eschatology or the last days. Now, in those days, 1971, a, a book had been out for about two or three years. It ended up selling 50 million copies. It was called The Late Great Planet Earth. This was a book that took the Christian world by storm. I mean, what a title, Late Great Planet Earth. You couldn't have come up with a better title at the end of the 60s when there was 
riots, the Black Revolution, all the hippies. It looked the you know Vietnam. I mean, this this is the external world is, is in utter chaos, and everybody wants to know where what's going to happen next. What what's what's coming? What, what how should we look at this? And here comes this book, the late great Planet Earth. The 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 author of the book uh, went to his name was Hal Lindsey, and a good guy. Can't, he's a nice man, very nice guy, good Christian guy. He went to a seminary, which right away, that's credibility, right, if you go to seminary, uh, that, that taught a certain viewpoint of eschatology. I didn't know anything about viewpoints or whether there are other ideas about eschatology, but this book, because of the title uh, and because of the credibility of the guy and because of the institute, uh, where he went, which was uh, Dallas Theological Seminary in, in uh, Dallas, Texas. Uh, this this book really found traction. 50 million copies were sold. I read the book in the fall of 1971, and I was hooked on what they were teaching. I, I didn't know any better. I mean, this is what was being put out there. Everybody believed it. Uh, it was widespread. Now, today, 50 years later, 50 years later, uh, that viewpoint is accepted in, I would say, 99.9% uh, .9 of all the churches worldwide. That's how powerful that opinion of the end times has gone and how much it's gained traction and taken root. And it wasn't until 10 or 15, 20 years ago that I started seeing problems with that viewpoint. And now it's come to where I'm sharing with you uh, what I think you might want to know about this because it's good to have many eyes. Uh, I call it angle vision, uh, many counselors uh, and many ways to look at things before we take it to heart, which most of us have already done. People, you know, you can't really talk to people that uh, very with very much uh, you know objectivity because they get so offended that if you have a different viewpoint and it contradicts theirs that you're the heretic not them <laughs> so if you have intellectual courage if you want to know the truth if you're willing to take a look at something that maybe you accepted a long time ago that you're suspect about now uh, this is this is going to be good for you it's good medicine to be able to step out of what you've been into and, and take another look at something before you reject it be simply because you don't agree. I mean, you look at the political world today, and uh, I have a sister who, you know, it, it, she could have gone to Berkeley the way she thinks. And of course, I'm on the other side of the spectrum. Uh, and she won't listen to anything that is, uh, you know, in deference to what her uh, viewpoint is. I hope you're not like that. I hope you're more secure uh, and able to entertain something that maybe isn't in the same uh, light of what you've already received. It took me 30 years uh, to to be honest enough to step out of what I accepted through that book, Late Great Planet Earth, and, and look at it from a different viewpoint. And so in dealing with the word heresy, it simply means opinion. People have opinions. Uh, there's a difference between opinion and truth, uh, and they're very, very hard to sometimes separate. But uh, if you're willing to step out of the boat, remember Jesus' disciples, when he walked on the water, were in fear of the storm, and only one was willing to step out of the boat, and that was Simon Peter. And he walked on the water, and then he got his eyes off the Lord and, and started looking at the storm, and uh, he sank. So uh, you're going to be tested if you begin to entertain what I'm about to tell you uh, by those that don't accept what we're about to say. And you might get your eyes on the storm and the conflict rather than on the truth or the person of Jesus who's trying to explain to us truth. So having said that, uh, I, that's the setup for this. Hopefully you'll receive it. I mean it in love. Uh, and it, the truth will set you free. It won't hurt you. So <laughs> there's nothing wrong with looking at this. So until the next time, uh, I'll be seeing you.